this is in scoliosis, in terms of the evaluation and treatment. And there have just been so many new advances and so many, and this is changing so quickly in, for the practice of, in the practice of medicine and the treatment of scoliosis that we probably will not be able to cover this all today, but we'll start with some of the concepts and some of the recent developments that have been going on. So, you know, we'll talk about what is new and what is old. I mean, not everything that is old is bad, but certainly uh, there's some new bracing involved, some new therapeutic advances involved, um, some new management's involved, and we'll try to go through at least some of them uh, for people who have scoliosis. So first of all, we all know that scoliosis is a curvature of the spine. It's a side curvature of the spine. So if you had a frontal curvature, which means you're hunchback, that would be called kyphosis. Scoliosis means your spine is curved to the side. So the first thing question is you ask is, is scoliosis dangerous for the children that we're going to be talking about who develop scoliosis? And the answer is that in the type of scoliosis, the most common form that we don't know what causes it, that happens mostly in young girls or mostly in young women around the age of puberty or between 11 and 14, it is not really dangerous. It doesn't cause heart and lungs to compress or not function well. It really is more an issue of uh, functionality in life, pain, uh, perhaps cosmetics. Um, so there's a number of issues uh, that deal with it. And there's different words that we use. If you have, if you have a round back with the scoliosis, we call that kyphoscoliosis. If the back goes the opposite way, like it's, it's, it's almost like a sway back, we call that lordoscoliosis. And really, it's not dangerous, as I wrote here, before 100 degrees. So that's really the answer. So unless the scoliosis is going to become very drastic, it's not truly dangerous to the patients. That's not true about some of the other scoliosis that we'll talk about and perhaps in, in future weeks. We'll be discussing congenital scoliosis, which means you're born with some kind of malformation of the spine. Perhaps uh, infantile, when it occurs in, in real in young infants, even though they have a normal-looking spine. And neuromuscular spine, where you have, there's something else wrong with the child. They have cerebral palsy, they have spinal muscular atrophy, they have arthrogryposis. And in those forms of scoliosis, they're much more dangerous just to leave them alone for the child. So what is our goal of treatment of scoliosis? Well, we, don't, we want it to cosmetically look good, that's for sure, because if most of the kids, if that's some of the tre reason for treatment, then it should look good. If the, patient, if the patients only sit, if the kids only sit, then they need to be sitting well. They should be standing well. We shouldn't lose our lung function, which is called pulmonary function. And if they have pain, we should relieve pain from this. And again, I said there's many different types, and there's a number of different causes, and we'll talk about all these different things, diagnosis and treatment, and some of the new advances involved in this. So I mentioned before that there's congenital types, which means you're born with it, and then your, your, the building blocks of your spine are incorrect. There's neuromuscular types, which we discussed, and then there's the idiopathic type, which means we don't know what causes it, and it can occur in very young infants, in, in people between, kids between the ages of, let's say, six and nine, then it'll be called juvenile, and the most common is adolescents above the age of nine from 10 to about 14. So let's discuss this. Let's discuss what we would do for this type of scoliosis, which is what I just described uh, before. And this is the most common, and it's probably up to 3% of the population. So in infantile scoliosis, we have no architectural abnormalities, but the children are very young. And since growth is a factor, we, we, that if you're growing, your scoliosis will most commonly advance more, and when you stop growing, it slows down. So we all, we all look at these different stages, or doctors look at different phases to try to figure out how much growth this person has left with their adolescent. Well, has the young woman had her period for the first time yet? It's always a question an orthopedic surgeon who treats scoliosis is going to ask the family or ask the young lady. What is the Risser sign? Well, that's, that's this little sign we get from a pelvis x-ray that shows us maturity by the bones. We can get hand x-rays. We, we can look at the growth plates of the pelvis, and all those help us determining how, you know, how long or how much further the child's going to grow, how many more years the child's going to grow. A very old staging was Tanner signs, and that just deals with um, some, skeleton, some uh, uh, secondary uh, characteristics of maturity when people go through puberty that's rarely used today to discuss uh, maturity levels. And so obviously if you're very young and you're growing and you haven't had your period yet, the young woman or the young boy has no axillary hair, well, you're going to go spurting up until that point. And that's when scoliosis is most dangerously involved. 
And people, for years we've looked at the causes of scoliosis. Like, we want to know what causes it in these people who are otherwise normal to develop scoliosis. And the answer is, we simply don't know. We've tried to look at the discs, we've looked at the brain causing it. We think we can try, try to figure it out, but really we don't know. In certain ways, if you take out, for instance, a pineal gland, which is a gland in the brain, well, a chicken will develop scoliosis, but that doesn't help very much. And there's been some other postulates too, but nothing truly has come forward. There are some associated problems, and sometimes we get MRIs to make sure your child or, or the child who has this doesn't have these other problems that can cause scoliosis. And these are just fancy terms that can happen in scoliosis. Tethered cord, cerebromyelia, that means a, a, a fluid on the cord. Um, and these are, and I don't have to go through all of these, but each one can be a reason why we're going to get an MRI for a child with scoliosis. And that's what scoliosis looks like, right? There's a, this is a right thoracic curve. It's, it's bent to the right side in this young woman. She bends forward, and we can see the prominence that she has, and that's because of the ribs twisting. And we do all kinds of evaluations, both in school and when you come to the doctor's office. And then there's some new genetics, right? We can get what's called a SCOLI score. It's a saliva test like, like from Ancestry.com. And basically, they can test whether or not you are, are at risk for advancing your scoliosis. The problem with this SCOLI score is it's very uniform to Caucasians. And the SCOLI score was developed in Utah. So it's a very uniform group of people. And perhaps in a country made of multiple ethnicities, and which are joined together, this may not be as useful in prediction. And it's also very, very selective. Your curve has to be a certain number of degrees, and you have to be a certain age to get this test and to make it worthwhile. So we look at whether or not you're balanced, if one shoulder is higher than another, where the, pro the rib prominence is, or the scapula is sticking out, which is called a shoulder blade. Perhaps they don't like the way the, the, your waist looks because your waist sticks out. And then you could look at different factors. And again, as you can see here, the shoulder is quite high. And we measure angles. We measure the most tilted vertebrae. And that gives us the direction of our curve and the magnitude of our curve. And it's measured in degrees. It's not measured in terms of percentage. It's just, you know, we have mild and severe, and we get different studies. And we used to use hooks, and this is what it used to look like when we fixed the scoliosis. We, we put these hooks and rods on the spine in the back, and we could fix the scoliosis. And there's a natural history to this. So we try to keep curves below 40 degrees by the time someone finishes growing, because those don't usually progress. When they're above 40 degrees and someone is skeletally mature, they most likely will progress. So if you're 13 years old or 15 years old, and you have a 45 degree curve, and even if it only gets one degree worse per year, by the time you're 45, you will have a 75 degree curve, which becomes much more significant in someone's life. So non-surgical treatment, and this has changed a lot over the years. One thing we've done now is I used to tell patients physical therapy or any kind of therapeutic modality is not going to work. That's not true anymore. We really believe that we can try to do things that can help. I don't know the answer if chiropractic medicine helps in this case, but it certainly can hurt. Um, electrical stimulation, Botox, all these things have been tried, but there's no real randomized trials or trials that look at this that determine whether or not this is useful. Um, we do know that observation is one method, but that's not doing anything. We can brace, and which one we'll talk about in a few minutes. And physical therapy, I do think now we use this thing called the Schroth or Schroth method, developed in Barcelona and Munich. And we do try to utilize people or physical therapists who are trained in the Schroth method to do this. It is like Pilates, but it is very specific for the spine, and it's not so it's easy to learn. It's not a panacea, but it certainly is quite good for scoliosis. And there will be some studies coming out proving that perhaps it is valuable in, in treating scoliosis and preventing progression. And then there's bracing. And that's usually, you have to have growth left to use bracing. It's usually when you're skeletally immature. The curve is usually somewhere between 25 and 35 degrees, but it's only good if you're growing. Which brace? Well, there's so many. The old Milwaukee when I was a child, which was when the brace came up to the neck, to Boston bracing, which is like this brace you see on this side. And now we've gone to more of these Rigo Chano or Chano like braces, which is associated with Schroth. However, that is not necessarily a, any better, and there's certainly no proof it's any better, um, and any type of um, brace that is utilized, as long as it's utilized for the correct hours and is correct, has some effectiveness. Excuse me one second. 
Okay, let's go on. Um, what is the Shroth method? Well, I said before, it's very specific, specialized physical therapy. You can learn it at home. But the jobs are learned to do it at home. And usually it takes about 20 visits to learn this. Um, and I've seen some really excellent results with this. But again, not, not a cure-all, but at least useful in some way of treating scoliosis non-operatively. And then we talk about surgery. And this is also becoming completely revolutionary now. Well, spinal fusion has been done since the 1950s with, with Harrington, um, and which was what we call those Harrington rods that people talked about. And we've gone to CD rods, to TSRH, and now we use pedicle screws, which means that we try to grab the spine in multiple levels. And for those of you who rock climb, you know you put multiple pegs in so that you, if you fall back, you can't just have each one pull out. So in this case, we put multiple screws in the spine to try to correct the scoliosis, and we weld it together, which is called a fusion. But that welding together obviously makes the spine stiffer. So how can we do it with fusion list surgery? And that's where we're coming to things maybe perhaps talk about some other time, such as vertebral body tethering, and we'll discuss that a little bit, um, the Apifix, which is a new device, which is not FDA approved yet, um, staples, and, and growing rods. And we talk about why you would use these different things, and they're not all interchangeable, and they're definitely not interchangeable, and they're not indicated for everybody. So fusion, spinal fusion, is still the gold standard in the treatment of severe scoliosis when we're talking about surgery. And I've gone through this entire process from hooks, like I showed you before, which worked well. Then we went to the front of the spine, and we put little devices in the front. And that was from the front, and we were able to correct the spine from the front as well. And you can see that. Now, which scar is better? Is it from the side a little bit better, if we have multiple little holes, or perhaps in the back? You know, it's interesting. People ask me that. And I think a scar someone can't see when it's on their back is probably bothers people less than even multiple little scars on their side. And that's before and after from a correction. So again, this is a pretty major curve, about 80 degrees. And again, this is where we use these pedicle screws, which are screws in the spine to hold the spine to weld it together. And that's what someone looks like right after that surgery. What about growing rods? And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about growing. Why would we use a growing rod? And this Magic is the name, and it's a brand name, trademarked from a company called Nuvasive out in, in California. And basically a growing rod, and a magic rod, is really utilized for very young kids who get scoliosis because you don't want to fuse them. You don't want to stop their growth of the spine, so you put a rod in. But it has to be used correctly. It has to be used at the right levels. It has to be used for the right age. It has to be used for the right degree of scoliosis. And you've got to be very careful utilizing this. It has to be done in really experienced hands when that is done. And there's a patient where we can manage a scoliosis in a very young child and lengthen this. And lengthen it without secondary surgery. It's just a magnet that we put on the skin every three to four months to allow it to elongate. It's not without complications. It's not without having to change the rods. But certainly, it is a good device used for very young children in the right hands, used correctly. Apifix, something I'm interested in, although it's not being used yet in the United States, is a device that you could, and hopefully we'll use it very soon. It's a non-constrained device that perhaps if someone's still growing and only has about a 30 or 35 degree curve, we could slowly, and the non-constrained system, allow them with physical therapy or very slowly ratchet-wise to correct just the center portion of the curve through a very small operation and then hold it there without fusing the spine. This has potential. We're not there quite yet in the future. Tethering. So vertebral body tethering is gaining a lot of acceptance now, and I'll end the conversation um, with this part, and then we'll go back to other, we'll talk about congenital scoliosis and neuromuscular scoliosis at a different, perhaps infantile at a different time. But regarding tethering, so what that means is you're not going to fuse the spine, but again, you have to go to the front of the spine and the side over here of the lumbar spine, and then you put it, you put a rope in, which you can't see, that connects them. It doesn't fuse it, but there are risks involved. The risk of overcorrection, the risk of the tether breaking, and then you've already gone into the, the chest cavity once, so it's not so simple. So again, tethering, again, should be used very, very, you know, for very select cases um, and, and, and has interest because it's not fusing, but again, it may make the spine more rigid as well. So again, there's a lot of answers are unanswered about tethering, but we're still working on different fusionless models, apifix tethering, and these are two of the most. I mean, stapling is no longer really being used. Just a couple of last things to talk about other issues in the future. Well, degree of x-rays. I think the number of degrees of x-rays 
that children are getting us way too much, and the exposure of radiation to the young child is a problem. So EOS is a company that, that created a machine that probably has 12% of the radiation exposure. So certainly, when we're getting so many body x-rays, using this EOS is certainly an advantage. How do we get rid of back pain? Um, do backpacks cause this? No, they don't cause your scoliosis. You can use a backpack. And then we've got to really discuss you know, how we're going to become better at fusionless surgery. But I don't think we're quite there yet, but we're certainly working on it. So I'm going to end um, with that discussion, and I did not really go further into a discussion of the surgery and things like that. I'm going to take some questions if anybody's out there on Facebook on this holiday weekend, um, and I'll try to answer any questions you have about scoliosis today. So I wish everybody a happy holiday, and, um, and we will certainly continue the issues for very specific types of scoliosis like achondroplasia and scoliosis or, kypho or, or spinal stenosis. And we'll try to do each topic of the spine even separately because I think it's overwhelming to hear too much about one topic. So thank you very much for listening and have a good day.